the cheapest sibling in the Galaxy S10 lineup. And although it's not as powerful on paper, it might just be enough for the average user. What's up guys, I'm Jared the Tech Avenger, and today we are giving you our unique take on the Galaxy S10e. It took Samsung 10 years to bring us this device, but not just this one. We have three in the lineup this year, and among those three, there may be one that tailors towards your specific needs or preferences. The S10e is the cheapest offering by Samsung in the S10 lineup and gives you 2019 performance in a small and easy to hold package. Speaking of package, let's show you what we got in the box. At 1,020 Canadian dollars, Samsung does not skimp out on accessories and gives you everything you need. In fact, they even have a screen protector pre-applied on the device right out of the box. Aside from the phone, we're given the instructions with a SIM eject tool an adaptive fast charging travel adapter, a USB-C to USB-A adapter for transferring data from another device, a USB-C to USB-A charging cable, and finally, some AKG tuned wired earbuds, which comes with a beautifully braided cable. The earbuds sound fantastic and not really what you would expect from a pair that's included in the box. We'll cover that more in detail in a later section. Now that we got that out of the way, let's present the star of the show. I'm a fan of the way this thing is designed. It looks elegant and the front of the device looks beautifully proportionate. I prefer the very subtle bezels around the phone, which allows just enough grip without causing any accidental touches. The hole punch for the camera is so subtle and I hardly notice it in the way while using apps, if at all. And while we're on the topic of the camera, I love the subtle ring light around it. It's great to know the camera is active when the light flashes, but apparently that won't be all it's used for. Now this phone doesn't have a notification light, but there are some rumors that an upcoming software update will allow the ring light to act as one. The speaker grill at the top is also hardly noticeable, but trust us when we say that that's not the case when it comes to how this thing sounds. But of course, we will get into that soon. I love the flat display look compared to the S10 and the S10 Plus, which has rounded edges. However, I did hear that the rounded edges are not as pronounced on this year's devices, so kudos to Samsung for that. But the S10e's flat display look I'm digging it. So let's look around the side of the device. We have on the left hand side, the volume rocker, which has a very tactile feel and noticeable when pressed. And right under that, we have the big speed button. So this might be a bit of good news for some, but for the first 48 hours, I didn't even notice that it was there. It was perfectly positioned on the S10e, so it's only there when you need it, unlike previous models where accidental presses were very common. I didn't press this button even once by mistake, and it might just be because of the size of the phone and how easy it is to hold. On top of that, the key can be remapped to open another app either with a single press or a double press. It won't disable Bigsby completely, but you can choose your preference. We'll actually create a tutorial on how you can do this and link it in the description down below. On the bottom, we have that highly coveted headphone jack, a USB-C port, a mic, and a bottom firing speaker that works together with the top front facing speaker. On the right hand side, we have the lone power button, but what is also interesting is that this doubles as a fingerprint sensor. We'll talk more about that later on here, but one thing I'd like to mention is that the power button is slightly recessed and flat. It's not my favorite in terms of design. I'm used to the power button being a little pronounced, so it's easy to hit, but again, that's my personal preference. Finally, at the top, we have a secondary mic, probably for noise cancelling, and a SIM slash SD card tray. The side of the device is pretty slippery, so you might want to get a case for this if you got butterfingers. The S10e is incredibly light. In fact, it's a bit lighter than my iPhone XS. Some people might equate weight or heft to quality, but I can say I prefer a lighter device, and there's nothing here that suggests that this is a cheap low-end phone. It feels premium and that's all that really matters here. I should also mention that this has an IP68 waterproof rating. So it's capable of lasting underwater to about 1.5 meters for 30 minutes. I wouldn't recommend taking it near water, but it's good to know that it'll be safe in case it gets a splash here or there. Companies use their own fancy buzzwords such as Retina or Infinity O to make their displays sound like they're out of this world. They sound great, but do they look great? With the S10e, I wasn't blown away by the display, but it's definitely not terrible by any means. Now my reasoning is as follows. The blacks are very deep. You can't even notice where the screen ends with a completely black image. However, I put it against the iPhone and the differences began to show. When loading a web browser, say Google's homepage, I can see the screen is noticeably brighter on the iPhone. The blue light filter, ambient mode, and any other settings were all turned off on the S10e. Screen mode was set to vivid and I also tried to play with the white balance, 
Both phones are cranked to full brightness as well. Anyway, I might just be crazy, but I thought I would let you guys know my thoughts on that. And besides, comparison is the thief of joy. And I can tell you that this display is such a pleasure to use and definitely holds its own. The average consumer won't notice these minor differences and the display is incredibly bright in any kind of environment. Using it in sunlight, I could see every bit of the screen without having to squint. When it comes to the quality of the displays, Samsung will not fail you. What I appreciate is the plethora of display options in the settings to tweak it to your liking. Some of the standard stuff is there, such as adaptive brightness, blue light filters and such, but we also have a dark mode, and the best part is that it's system-wide. And as mentioned before, we have the ability to change the screen mode, as well as the white balance temperature and RGB colors. Watching movies on this display is such a treat, and that hole punch cutout, yeah, much better than a notch in my opinion. Ah, the main function of the phone. Yeah, we haven't forgot about that, and we got you covered here. Now reception can vary among carriers, but we tried multiple SIM cards and were very pleased with the results. We had no issues making phone calls and drop calls were non-existent. Noise cancellation was fantastic and we tried both talking indoors and outdoors and the person on the other end could hear us loud and clear. Phones in 2019 are smooth for the most part. Android has been refined and technical specifications are becoming less of a thing among average consumers, as even the lowest spec devices can run Android pretty well. However, the Galaxy S lineup is supposed to be Samsung's most capable devices and this year it's no exception. Even though this year's iteration has been split up into three different offerings, all three include the same processor across the board. Some of the more expensive models do have more storage and RAM, but we're very curious to see how the cheapest device with the lowest RAM would perform on a daily basis. I've used Samsung devices before and even last year's S9 was nothing spectacular. I would see some lag here and there throughout the OS and games would close after staying in memory for a bit. But that was last year and I have no idea what software and hardware magic Samsung pulled here, but this device is amazing. And of course, I'll touch on the new Samsung One UI in a bit, but this phone is smoother than a baby's bottom. That's kind of a weird analogy. <laughs> yeah, no shit. <laughs> All you gotta know is that this thing is fluid. I've not come across any lag or stutter, even in the Bixby Home section, which usually caused some issues on last year's device. Not only that, but we've been playing all sorts of games on this phone, like Subway Surfers, Temple Run, and Fortnite, and it had no problems with graphics or keeping them in memory. Nor did the phone get extremely warm when playing. I was impressed. And last but not least, this thing runs DeX. By the way, we will have a review on Samsung DeX on the S10e shortly, so be sure to hit that subscribe button and the bell notification so you don't miss that. Long story short, Samsung did not skimp out when it came to performance on their cheapest S10 device. But no device is perfect, and while we're on the topic of performance, let's talk about that fingerprint sensor. I love the placement of the fingerprint sensor, but I gotta say, it's not always the fastest method when it comes to unlocking my device. When you're focusing on unlocking the device and placing your finger slowly and accurately on the power button, it works. But there have been more times where I'm in a rush, and quickly trying to unlock it, it would have issues keeping up. I would say it worked probably 80% of the time. That's not really that accurate, but I did add face unlock to work in conjunction with it. And together, it unlocks most of the time. Also, it hardly works when your fingers are wet, so keep that in mind. Goodbye TouchWiz and goodbye Samsung Experience UI. And good riddance. Gone are the days when Samsung's horrible, clunky UI would sour the experience of beautiful hardware. I guess they took two cracks at it, but of course, third time's a charm. The new Samsung One UI atop Android 9.0 is incredibly smooth. I've never been a fan of Samsung phones just because of their software skin. TouchWiz and the Samsung Experience UI felt half-baked and very bloated. I remember trying to use the Galaxy S9 with Samsung Experience UI, thinking the hardware would actually compensate, but I could still see some jitter and lag throughout the OS. I can tell you with utmost confidence that those days are behind us. One UI is buttery smooth. Swiping across your home screens and then to Bixby Home shows no slowdown compared to previous versions. Even opening apps shows no stutters and apps remain in the background even after several hours. I played Subway Surfers and left the app in the background while I went to watch a movie. After I was finished, I opened it up and it was in the same spot as it was in before. And let's not forget about that system-wide dark mode. 
This is a much needed option that not only looks great, but is also very easy on the eyes. I purposely left mentioning the hardware last year, as I feel up until this iteration of the Galaxy phone, it was the software that was really holding this lineup back. I mean, the processors in the S9, the S8, and the S7 were capable of delivering a smooth experience, but I feel it just wasn't optimized with the software. Though here we are in 2019, equipped with a Snapdragon 855 and six gigs of RAM, and we have the ideal Galaxy phone. I should also mention, this is the lowest end version of the S10. You can't really get an S10 weaker than this. And even yet, it's amazingly powerful and capable of running reliably and consistently. I can safely say that you will not be disappointed in the performance of this device if you don't wanna pay the extra for the higher end models. It's funny, most reviews these days focus on the camera more than anything else. I mean, it's an important aspect of a phone, but I just wanna to touch on this mainly because there are so many camera comparisons out there. And in my opinion, phones in 2019 have more than capable cameras for the average user. I don't wanna dig into each and every pixel or compare to other phones, because like I said previously, comparison is the thief of joy. And honestly, most of you are probably getting this phone because of the overall package not just the camera. So instead, I'm going to show you what the main cameras are capable of, its features, and also what you can do with video on this device. Let's start with the rear camera package. We got dual cameras on the S10e, unlike the three camera setup on the S10 and S10 Plus. However, the lens of the three that this phone is missing is the telephoto. If that's actually important to you, then check out the other two phones. But digital zoom is still offered on this device. We still got a 12 megapixel wide lens as well as a 16 megapixel ultra wide for some stunning landscape shots. On the front, we have the one main selfie camera at 10 megapixels, but it's really the camera app itself that unleashes the power of these lenses. There are a variety of options to choose from when shooting pictures, such as pro mode, where we have the option to change ISO, aperture, white balance, among other things, panorama, and even a section dedicated for food. The live focus feature has a bunch of sub options varying from the standard portrait, where you can adjust the blur, spin, zoom, and finally color point. This feature is available on both the front and the rear camera. Out of them all, color point is probably my favorite. Although as you can see here, it's definitely not there yet in terms of the software. It could distinguish the sky from other parts of the photo and had trouble with the section around those trees. It's very hit and miss, but I'm sure that will improve with updates. In low light, it's nothing special, but it can hold its own if you need to take a pic of a city skyline or a dimly lit area. The front facing camera is quite clear, and although edge detection is not perfect in some portrait shots, you can change the blur effect to increase or decrease the intensity. Another feature which we think is really handy is holding your palm up to take a selfie. This feature is pretty awesome as you don't need to fumble around for the shutter button. We mentioned that in our top six features video on the S10e. I'll put that link in the description below and try and post one right up here if you haven't seen that yet. In terms of video, we can record at 4K 60 frames per second, 1080p at 240 frames per second, and 720p at 960 frames per second. This sample here was recorded at 1080p just to give you an idea of what it looks like. We don't render our YouTube videos in 4K yet, so we can't really show you what it looks like, but from what we see here at 1080p, I'm nothing but impressed. The clarity of the video is fantastic, and of course, let's not forget about that super steady feature on the new S10. Here is a video with super steady off. I'm not sure if it uses optical image stabilization when the super steady is off, but when the feature is enabled, the difference is like night and day. We also tested out the super slow-mo. It works great, just like when we did our review on the Note 9, but this just goes to show Samsung is leading the pack when it comes to camera features. Lastly, when talking about the camera features, I just want to touch on Bigsby Vision. Yeah, it's, honestly, I, I don't know what I would use this for. Mainly because it's so hit and miss. I mean, it works great when you are analyzing very common products, but random stuff, it just doesn't get right. I tried this random a &W can, and it showed me a bunch of other random cans. 
I think it's more of a gimmick at the moment than anything else. Clearly, it's not as good as Google Lens. Yeah, like, what? Well, what is it showing me? Now, battery technology has not changed much throughout the years. That's kind of disappointing, but OEMs are trying to compensate by optimizing the hardware and software to be more efficient. For now, that's really all we can ask for, and having a phone that can get through a full day of usage, and then some, is great. I thought the battery in the S10e, being the smallest in the lineup at 3100 milliamps, would suffer due to this. So we did our test a little bit differently, just to give you guys an idea of how long you can expect this to last in various scenarios, such as light, medium, and heavy usage. We understand that some days you might not use it as much as others. We put together a chart when testing the device and used it from full to empty in different scenarios. I use my daily driver at around moderate usage on average. Some days I might use it lightly and others I might plow through the battery before early evening. In any scenario though, the S10e looks like it's more than capable of keeping up. With heavy usage, we got a whopping six hours of screen on time. And all these tests did not have a battery saver on at any point. So just imagine how long this thing would last with battery saver enabled. I gotta say, I was pretty impressed with what I could squeeze out of this device and I can't ask for much more from a device that is this small. Now, sound on a phone may seem trivial to some. You might say, well, it's just a phone. If you want good sound, then use headphones. While that might be ideal to some of you, there are people who want to have ideal sound quality on the go. And let me tell you, these speakers won't literally blow you away, but figuratively speaking, damn, they are awesome. At full volume, these speakers can be heard throughout a large room. There isn't any distortion at the loudest setting either, and when holding the phone in landscape, you can actually distinguish between the left and right channels. The Dolby Atmos that is included on the device might be what makes the difference here, although trying the different modes just sounded the same to me. I keep it on auto so the phone can decide what's best. Working alongside that beautiful display, I feel like watching movies on the S10e would be quite a treat. But for those moments where you don't want to disturb the people around you, Samsung also included a pair of AKG tuned wired earbuds for your listening pleasure. The sound quality on these are fantastic and mixes the highs, mids, and lows just right to bring you the best listening experience possible. They fit in my ear great, but for those who can't find the right fit out of the box, you have some included ear tips to play around with. Guys, I hope we covered most of what you came here to look for in the Galaxy S10e. And honestly, this is one of my favorite Galaxy devices thus far. I've never really recommended a Samsung phone to those coming from an iPhone, just because they're used to the consistent fluidity of the OS and things just working together within their ecosystem. I feel like Samsung was always here or there. They didn't really have a vision on an ecosystem that works in harmony. But with the introduction of the Galaxy Buds, the S10 lineup, and the new One UI, it seems like this company is finally taking those users into account to deliver a seamless experience. I think now is the time I can actually start recommending this phone with confidence to someone who wants to switch over from an iPhone. What do you guys think of the new S10e? And if there's something that we missed or you want some clarification on, let us know in the comments down below. We will be covering the Samsung Galaxy Buds as well as DeX on the S10e in the coming weeks, so be sure to hit that subscribe button and the bell notification for those updates. It's been a pleasure, guys. Like always, I'm Jared the TechVenger. Don't forget, when it comes to tech, the TechVengers are there. We got your back.